Hi, and welcome to Mammograms and Me from metro.co.uk. This is a new podcast. It's a series all about my campaign to find the million missing mammograms and to help find the thousands of women walking around with undiagnosed breast cancer right now. Hosted by me, Dawn Butler, a Labour MP, first elected in 2005, I launched the hashtag Find the Million campaign with the Metro in 2022. It was shocking to me that around 8,000 people were walking around with breast cancer and they didn't know it. Each week I'll be speaking to experts, doctors and people with a deep understanding of breast cancer. I'll be discussing their experiences, the inside story on breast cancer and the kind of support that's out there. And I'm really pleased that I've got the amazing TikTok doc, Dr. Nigat, with me today. Um, doctor and author. Oh, God. <laughs> that still hasn't sunk in. Hello. Hello today. Hi, how are you? I'm good. It's honestly a real honour to see you. And you're looking so well. You oh, look amazing. Thank you. And you look beautiful as always. I try. I try. <laughs> I have to when I'm TikToking. <laughs> TikTok doc. Do you like that? TikTok doc. I do, because I think that um, mainstream media doesn't always capture the information and people are looking at health information and getting their advice from social media. And we can't discount the fact that that's Mm -hmm. becoming a bigger part of our everyday lives. And there are no age barriers. There are no barriers really for any anybody, uh, race, class, ethnicity. The only barrier I would say is probably if you don't have access to social media. Mm -hmm. But uh, the accessibility and the ease of being able to empower someone is huge. And if I can do that on, say, TikTok, then I'm very proud of that. And you do re- you cover really important issues, especially that women go through. And like your book, The Knowledge, um, your guide to female health from menstruation to menopause. I notice that a lot of problems that women have starts with men, right? <laughs> um, but, <laughs> I'm making but, no comments. <laughs> but... Um, and you've also got a section in there on breast cancer. Mm. Um, tell me how important it is for you to get the message out there in sort of bite-sized chunks so that women and young women of all ages take it on board. I think you sort of hit the nail on the head when you said bite-sized chunks. Women are busy, they're mothers, they're daughters, um, they've got elderly relatives that they might be looking after, they are career women now. Um, And even when they're home, there's always something that they're looking after. And I always find women never put themselves first. Mm -hmm. And I'm the same. I'm a mother to three boys. Um, My youngest is still five. um, And everything revolves around the household and then my work. And then actually at the end of that mainstream of work, I will say, okay, now I need to focus on myself. So the way that women access information is in that bite-sized chunks. Mm -hmm. Being on social media, say whether that's Reels or Instagram or YouTube, Um, then I can make sure that the information is in two to three minutes whilst you're doing something else. Hence why I think the medium of podcast is fabulous because Mm -hmm. I would probably be ironing clothes. Mm -hmm. And then listening (laughs) And then listening in or doing some chores around the house and listening in. Because what happens is, is that uh, as a woman, we're multitaskers. Mm -hmm. And for women to have access about all the um, biological changes that they'll go through, because every woman is on a journey, whether she starts... Uh, as a young girl, just starting mm. her period, to the next thing is that she's thinking of actually coming off contraceptives and planning mm-hmm. a family, um, and then maybe breastfeeding, and then postpartum care, and then when she's older into the perimenopausal years, and then throughout all, all of that, our boobs, our breasts are changing, mm-hmm. and then they're changing, they're having uh, pain or problems or sensitivity to them, and then how can you empower that woman to go, right, pick up the signs early, mm-hmm. understand what's happening to your biological change, and then I'm hoping that my book was able to give advice along the way. Because there's so many, you're a Muslim woman, mm-hmm. you wear a hijab. Um, there's so many taboos, isn't there? So when we appeared on uh, Good Morning Britain together, and I was talking about my breast cancer journey, and you were talking about the women that come into your surgery, and then in the end you demonstrated how to examine your boob with your clothes on you had your clothes on and we had a lot of people respond Mm. to that afterwards I mean some people were like it was amazing to have women of of color talking about breast cancer on TV because that's often not the case 
And so it was nice that we were doing it in such an open way. But then there were also people who were just like, oh my God, you're a Muslim woman and you were touching your boob through your yeah, clothes. Yeah, you're showing off your breasts, yeah. And so what are the taboos and how do we break them down? I think it comes with that unabashful, unapologetic saying, here I am. Mm. I'm going to take up space on a screen and show you without shame that mm. this is how you do a breast exam. Because for me, doing that, um, I did think about it before mm -hmm. I, I, I did it. And I thought that actually if one woman who wears a hijab, who sees someone who looks like her, mm -hmm. because if you can see it, you can believe it will happen to you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. what happens is so much the mainstream uh, advertising or propaganda, as I would say, or, or uh, messaging is always tailored to a white audience. Mm -hmm. So you, I've never seen a hijab woman on a breast can cancer campaign, even mm -hmm. now, and it's 2023. Mm -hmm. And I'm now starting to see black women, which is incredible. But mm -hmm. that's still rare, actually, mm -hmm. if you think about it. So you if you can't see it... that's part of the it, reason why some people think black people don't get cancer. Yeah. Or Muslim women don't get cancer. Uh, because uh, because do. they're not seen. Look, in our, we go about our life in our 20s and 30s thinking we're bomb-proof. Mm -hmm. Nothing will ever happen don't to us. Don't be just. <laughs> and, when, and then when you've got messaging around you saying that this doesn't... This is the, you're not represented in this. You actually think that it doesn't happen to mm -hmm. you either. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally have that, you know, see it and you can be it. And mm -hmm. if you have that representation, mm -hmm. um, that adds so much more value. Mm -hmm. So for me to do that on ITV, I was saying, look, I need women to understand that this can happen at any age. And we know breast cancer isn't mm -hmm. limited just to older women. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately pick up breast cancer in my patients in my NHS clinic in younger women mm -hmm. as well. It and is actually getting younger, isn't it? And it's the biggest killer of young women, yeah. breast cancer, uh, 25 and on. Do we know why that is? So let's look at just the of what happens with our breast tissue. Mm -hmm. um, we know that one in seven women will get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. That's a high statistic mm -hmm. by the very nature that we have boobs. So mm -hmm. when we start our periods, estrogen starts working around our body mm -hmm. and... Um, when you end up getting changes in those hormones mm -hmm. because you're ovulating uh, in your estrogen and progesterone levels, you end up getting sort of that slight tenderness within the, the breast cells mm -hmm. tissue and the cells are changing. Mm -hmm. Where you get change, you get mistakes. Where mm -hmm. you get mistakes, you and I will say, ah, oh, that's breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But it, that change is happening all the way through our cycles. We're having a cycle every month. Mm -hmm. up until what the age of 45 mm -hmm. so unfortunately mistakes do happen and cells can change and when that mistake happens it multiplies mm -hmm. and we do know that there's lots of other factors involved um, we are getting fatter as a nation whether we mm -hmm. like it or not mm -hmm. obesity has a factor to play smoking has a factor to play mm -hmm. lack of um, uh, activity exercise mm -hmm. has, a, has a factor to play stress mm -hmm. we're living in a very stressful um, time at the moment mm -hmm. alcohol alcohol exactly mm -hmm. is another factor and then there are some factors that you just can't run away from, like genetic factors like BRCA1 or Lynch syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so those all, if you have that combination mm -hmm. of risk factors, unfortunately, your, your risk of getting breast cancer is higher. So you can reduce a lot of that mm -hmm. by making sure, right, I'm going to keep my BMI at a healthy weight or I'm going to make sure that my weight is maintainable at a certain stage where I feel healthy, I'm exercising, mm -hmm. I stop smoking, I reduce my alcohol to 14 units a week. Um, and then I am self-examining. Mm -hmm. And self-examination, I always say, shouldn't be limited to when you're in your 50s. Mm -hmm. We should be checking our boobs right at from 15, mm -hmm. 16 onwards and yeah. making it a habit. Do you remember there was a campaign like years ago, I remember this campaign sort of getting to know your body. Yeah. And then it's almost got to a stage where it's almost a shame to get your, to know your body. But there's something to say to looking in the mirror every day and looking at your body and looking if you can see any changes. And I suppose part of it is being comfortable with our body. I think lots of women in particular, but you know, guys as well, um, they look in the mirror and don't like what they see. So mm. they tend not to look at the whole person. That's absolutely true. And you earlier on said, you know, it was a bit shocking that as a Muslim woman, you were you know, self-examining mm. your breast, even with clothes on. Mm. It's because- I mean, all you did was what, you raised your arm. Yeah. And then you use like the, the, palms. Flat, the palms of your hand to just yeah. feel around. But the thing is, our boobs are hypersexualized. Mm. We can't get away with it. 
Mm. We can't run away from that as women. And when your organs are not your own, they're hypersexualized, mm. you almost feel like, well, this is something that I reserve for my partner or my husband or mm. whatever, or they reserve for my baby for when I breastfeed them. They're not something that I think there is that psychology that plays a role where you think it's not part of you. And so mm. you don't pay attention to it. And yes, there's a huge issue with body image. In my book, I've got women of different sizes and um, mm. different color as well. So there's a lot of women of color. There's a, an examination of how to do your vulva. Mm. And it's a, a, a woman of color and she's got stretch marks on her thighs. Mm. And when I was going through the editorial process, I was shocked at how many of the my test market younger women were going, oh, Dr. Arif, she has stretch marks. Mm. Like, can you, is that, can you mm. take those out? And mm. I said, no, that is absolutely normal. Mm. So stretch marks on your boobs, stretch marks on your thighs, on your arms, they are normal. We need to yeah. normalize. We have to start embracing that, exactly. right? What did your mum think of the book? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, page three inwards, there is a picture of a black vulva. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of that mm -hmm. because most medical textbooks only default to sort of paler skin or mm -hmm. white skin. And so I said, no, no, I really want my women, mm -hmm. uh, as a woman of color myself, to be represented in this. And um, and it takes up, as you can see, a whole a, mm -hmm. a whole page, really, because mm -hmm. to get all the labels put on, we have to go around the picture. And the printers came back to us and said, oh, Dr. Arif, would you want to consider just making it a lighter color so that we can get the pictures onto the page? and not go around the, sc and then they realized that actually in medical school, that's probably what's happened to all my medical books. You default to a paler skin because it's the cost of printing is cheaper wow. that way. Just and imagine getting a raise because of the cost of printing. Yeah. But then that means, you know, you can't see it and mm. you can't be it. Yeah. And that sort of whole analogy. Or understand it because I didn't have any symptoms. So yeah. they, when they talk about breast cancer, they talk about um, the dimpling of the skin or mm. um, the nipple leaking. So, I mean, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. And so... And it looks to, different. It on, looks different on darker, on darker skin. skin. And precisely that. So I said, look, we need to take up space in the book. I don't mm. care. I'm not compromising on it. But my mother, as she opened the book, turned to that page and just went, oh, darling, didn't you have anything better to do? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, but this is precisely why we need to show women. And the same with breast cancer. You know, it, the, the, the markers that we have, mm. if you Google it, the first thing that comes up is all, you know, sadly still mm. white Caucasian skin. But mm. we know the pure de orange, that dimpling of the skin that you're mm. talking about, actually looks slightly different it might not even appear mm. that's the scary thing mm. for me as a woman of color that if that's one of the signs you're looking for and for some women in my surgery that's the only sign mm. they don't even feel a lump yeah yeah and that's the only sign but if i they've got no reference point to mm. say what it looks like mm. or for example no pictures of what leaky nipple might look mm. like or mm. what does um, a change in the skin sort of tones mm. And in black and Asian skin, the skin, the changes in the skin tone might mm. be different because mm. we know our skin doesn't appear red. Mm. Like if I hurt myself, it just turns into a darker brown mm. <laughs> rather yeah. than a, a yeah. red, mm. which is the redness I'm looking for on mm. a breast mm. picture. Um, and that is what concerns me. And this is why representation Absolutely. is so important. And for the people that say, oh, why does it matter? And you're always talking about race. I mean, the fact is that women of color get diagnosed later mm. and have a higher risk of they die uh, twice the rate of white women mm. and they could be diagnosed early so the reason why I thought it was so important I mean I was shocked when I established that there was like a million missing mammograms yeah. and completely flawed to think that there's like 8,000 women plus depending on you could, it's 8 to 12,000 women um, and I, I say women, you can be trans men, non-binary, walking around with breast cancer and they don't know it. And the thing is, if you catch it early... The prognosis is so good. So good. But let's look at Way the symptoms. Way better than it was years ago. It's like 66% in, you know, in the last just few years mm. it has improved. So 66% of women sort of survive breast cancer now. But if you catch it early, and like I did, your chances just live in a, a normal life i mean it's it's literally life-changing to catch it early you said something really cute actually and i and i the thought back to what i have in my consulting room you said people go why do you hark on about this all the time and why do you talk about women's health or you know black women in particular 
um, I'm reminded of a text by an author called Colleen Hoover, and she's a, a writer and a poet, and she wrote about women and the trials and tribulations that they go through. And she's, w- she's written, my grandmother went through it, my mother went through it, I'm going through it, and I'll be damned if my daughter goes through mm. it. And mm. I think that is the reason that you and I mm. constantly have these conversations yeah. and you do what you do because yeah. you'll be damned if the next generation does it and it stops with us. We yeah. have to be the generation that says enough. We have to be the women of colour that yeah. says enough. We have to be the women who are putting our heads up above the parapet to say, mm. look, these are the symptoms of breast cancer yeah. that I need you to look out for because you could be walking around with breast cancer not knowing it. So mm. the pandemic changed how what you do um, as a GP the pandemic changed how you do your job the pandemic changed me because I was diagnosed with um, breast cancer it it was just a crazy when I think back it was a very crazy time I mean you throw the pandemic into you know your health and what happens you throw the fact that the nhs is on its knees um it was quite a traumatic journey like so it's a traumatic journey sort of uh for me and also not wanting to talk about it so i didn't want to talk about it for a number of reasons because i was thinking oh my god i'm a bit of a public figure mm. uh there's a lot of people who are gonna abuse me no matter what mm. and i'm struggling to, to isn't that sad really sad that's really sad because yeah, uh, as a woman in a powerful position and so you sort of think but what do other women do who don't mm. have that level of voice mm. and this is why i think it was like so important i mean i i haven't got the gene i i'm like i suppose a lot of people think oh i'm never going to get breast cancer i mean i've got two friends who went for a screening with me one's fine one had a partial mastectomy mm. last week and there's people who think oh it'll never happen to me I was always kind of hyper vigilant because my mum had breast cancer my sister had breast cancer and it was that worry all the time whenever I go for a screening oh my goodness it might happen to me but then I felt comfortable and I thought I'm Don't. okay but because mum and your sister had breast cancer, were you hyper vigilant in examination or just going to screening? Yes, were I was self examining. I was not self examining as much as I should, but I looked at my boobs every day in mm-hmm. the mirror. And that's why I think there is this thing about loving our bodies. So I looked at my boobs every day. Uh, there were no changes okay. in my boobs at all. Um, But when it was time to go for the mammogram, I did what you said earlier on. I was like, oh God, I haven't got time for that. I've got so much stuff to do. Eventually I went. And yeah, to get that news was shocking. Because you had no symptoms. You didn't even feel a lump. No, no lump. Uh, No no lump in the armpit, no no changes to the, no pain. And like you say, no changes in size to the breast at all. And it was just on the mammogram. Just on the mammogram. And I think this is why, I mean, it makes me so happy as a GP, not happy for your <laughs> diagnosis, I'm so sorry. Yeah. But it makes me so happy as a doctor because I think A, you went for the screening. Mm-hmm. Um, and B, this is where screening is so brilliant mm. because it picks it up. And the fact that there's a million mammogram that went missing. Million. There's in, a million. In the pandemic. Yeah. How is, do we get those women? Some women are scared of mammograms. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically for those people who've not been to one put your boob in between two plates Mm -hmm. they squash it one way and then they squash it another way i think they squash it three ways i mean they say it's just screening it should be called a squashing because it's just (laughs) just squashing i don't know i think squashing might put people off i'm gonna get my boobs squashed you're squashing but that's literally what it is right you're squashing your boobs in like three different ways um why because what we want to do it's it's taking a 3D picture of Mm. the breast tissue and the breast tissue is full of fat cells. Mm. And so what we need to do is try and find the cancer cells which are going to appear as white cells. Mm. So women over the age of 50 or 52 is when they're invited. And that's the reason that is, is because the idea is that they have less estrogen or less estrogenized breast tissue. Mm -hmm. And a mammogram, if it's uh, just less estrogenized cells and it's fat cells will appear black, 
mm. and cancer cells will appear white. So it's really mm. easy to pick it up. Mm. So that's why we say ductual carcinoma. So it's mm. in situ within the ducts. It's the early, early stages mm -hmm. and we can pick it up. However, women who have densest breast cells, mm -hmm. so highly estrogenized breasts or not in the menopausal phase of their life yet, then they will actually have white cells or white breasts on a mammogram mm -hmm. and a white cancer on a white mammogram you just can't see it that's that so density. density and women of color tend to have more they dense do breasts. The, the data isn't so brilliant but the data mm. is showing us that yes um black and asian women do tend to have denser breasts mm. that's not to say caucasian women don't mm -hmm. But younger and younger, younger women, women of yes, all that's the colors thing. have yeah. denser breasts exactly right? and for them that's why the the examination is so important and that's why getting ultrasound scans for mm. them would be the best thing but that's not a great screening tool mm. because an ultrasound scan will need a highly qualified sonographer mm. but also then it will take half an hour to do and we can't do that whereas a mammogram is a very quick procedure as you know so it's mm. those plates that squish your boob mm. um, and the fear that's around that um, I'll tell you a quick story. It's mm. quite funny, actually. Um, I hope my mother doesn't mind me telling you <laughs> this. But mm. my mother, Pakistani woman, Punjabi speaking, doesn't speak much English. She had mm. her first breast cancer screening appointment. She didn't go. And I happened to pop around for something else. And I saw it on the mantelpiece. And I said to my own mother, you need to go to your breast screening. And she goes, no, 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 I can't go. Because Mrs. Siddiqui down the road, mm. made up name. But, mm. you know, my neighbor down the road went and she said that they squished her boobs and then they pulled on it and now she has <laughs> saggy boobs <laughs> i don't want saggy boobs <laughs> i said to her well that, you're talking to your daughter who's a doctor and that's mm. utterly ridiculous but when you have a bad experience women talk yeah you're going to tell each other yeah. and she must have had a bad experience bless her mm. over exaggerated between mm. her group of friends and being pakistani women anyway i can say that being pakistani mm. and so um when you have a good experience you have to come back and tell your community that. Tell your group of friends that. Yeah, that's important. That's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you do that, you're just like reassured and you won't just, sit, like you said, I got it, you're busy, you're doing mm. your surgeries, mm. you're going into parliament, mm. okay, I'll park it. Mm. And the number, it was important because then the number of women that then went for their screening, which made me feel that sharing my journey was important. You did get all the conspiracy theories as well. There was... Um, somebody has said that when you go for a biopsy, um, when because it's like a long needle, yeah. which they said don't look, but I did look. Of course you would. That's really, you doing. Oh, honestly, it was <laughs> you would have very look. scary. Um, but but it didn't. You didn't feel anything. No, it's a very thin, very fine thin needle. needle. Yeah. And the rumor was that that um, by having a biopsy, you spread the cancer because it's like piercing and. Somebody on social media like used a balloon as an example and then pierced the balloon and the water went everywhere and said, that's what they're doing. They're spreading cancer yeah. in your body by doing that. Unfortunately, there are lots of conspiracy theories. Mm. The and pandemic- they think they're clever doing yeah. that. Well, the pandemic was the worst for that. And mm. it yeah. that's why I think health content creators such as myself who are doing this as mm. NHS GPs, we should be on those platforms trying mm -hmm. to demystify the myths, etc. Uh, categorically doesn't do that. What you're doing is putting a fine needle in and taking those cells out. Using a balloon full of water is completely different because mm. cancer cells aren't water cells. They're mm. a completely different consistency, mm. for goodness sake. Mm. But unfortunately, um, when you've got a very good trending sound, something that's going to go viral and mm. it's, it intrigues individuals, then mm. obviously that will go like wildfire within a community and scare people and that is something that i think that uh social media uh organizers and platforms have a real responsibility yeah. to to tackle that and to be because fair because cancer doesn't cancer doesn't isn't a liquid form yeah it's certain circumstances where it exists and grows if you move it just a, a millimeter a fraction outside of that circumstance it doesn't necessarily grow Let's look at what cancer is essentially. Cancer is um, cells which have a similar DNA to your DNA, which mm. are mistakes, and mm. they grow in clumps and they get mm. bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they turn into a tumor, and then they, mm. the tumor breaks off and then spreads in the bloodstream. I mean, I'm oversimplifying that yeah. because, but I, I think for this conversation, mm. it's important to do that. 
what happens is when you're taking a biopsy, you're just taking a clump of those cells. It doesn't mean you're spreading them anywhere at all. And also, if it is going to spread, then actually it will be via your <coughs> it'll be via your bloodstream more than anything. And the theories that go around uh, are sometimes comical, but also slightly dangerous and slightly worrying. People think that cancer can be spread spread through air. It doesn't. Mm. It's not in droplets. It's mm. not going to be spread through air. They think it can be spread through touch. Mm. It doesn't. That isn't the case either. Well, Just because they say, especially like culturally, sometimes they say, "What did you do wrong oh, to get cancer?" Oh, or, that you know, breaks me when they mm. do that. So I, obviously, being from a faith group, I hear and see this often that I see women and I've seen it in family friends and dear close friends who've died from breast cancer. So I, I think that we can come to a conclusion that the majority of people have been touched or affected by mm. breast cancer, if not directly, indirectly. And um, some women I find have a fatalistic view that this was God's will and I was going mm. to get it. And I see that in my Muslim community as well. And the other sort of thing is, is you must have done something wrong to mm. be able to get cancer. I think that those sort of narratives are incredibly, incredibly concerning. Mm. And this is where faith groups play a huge part, especially with ethnic minority communities where mm. faith is a huge part mm. of their everyday. Um, and we should be able to educate each other about what breast cancer is and yeah. have those open, non-stigma, taboo conversations which aren't hyper-sexualizing yeah. our breasts. So um, estrogen plays a huge role in cancer sometimes it's like estrogen allows the cancer to develop and grow and so um my cancer was estrogen fueled so i'm on tamoxifen mm. to and like we need estrogen right it's like a lubricant for our bones yeah and to to get around and you know to that we can walk because without it we're just stiff and yeah. i'm on estrogen and I mean, I'm on a tamoxifen, tamoxifen. which is an estrogen blocker. It's yeah. an estrogen blocker. So let me just sort of refine a couple of things that you said. Mm. They are mainly because um, we do have a lot of fear around estrogen when it comes to breast cancer. And that's historically because estrogen has been really widely misunderstood. Mm. Estrogen is a really important hormone. Mm. And it is the estrogen that influences our cells and not just in our breasts. Mm -hmm. We have lots of estrogen receptors, mainly in our brain, mm -hmm. our boobs. And everyone has estrogen, right? Yeah, men as well. Mm -hmm. That's why men can get breast cancer. Um, and we have lots of estrogen receptors around our womb and our vulva and our vagina as well. Mm -hmm. So estrogen is something our immune system uses as an immune modulator. Mm -hmm. But we know when you get high levels or you get a surge or a change in estrogen levels, then that impacts our boob tissue. And when mm -hmm. that boob tissue gets affected, cells can change and that's when mistakes happen. Estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer. I think mm. that that's a, a really uh, confusing statement to say when mm. you're told it's an estrogen positive receptor. Mm -hmm. It just means that those receptors that are there are estrogen receptors. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like saying to our fat cells mm -hmm. where we produce a lot of our sex hormones, you know, your fat cells mm. are sex hormone receptors. Mm. Well, yeah, of course they are. But the reason we give estrogen blockers is because we don't want any remnants of a cancer to come back mm -hmm. or to regrow because the changes in the cells happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a temporary solution that we give in order to make sure that there is recovery. But I think that I am, and me and lots of other doctors are now sort of starting to say to women, please don't fear estrogen. Mm. And not all estrogens are the same. There are different categories of estrogen mm -hmm. that we give. Um, and so when it comes to things like hormone replacement therapy, actually topical vaginal estrogen that we use for vaginal atrophy is very safe to use whilst using tamoxifen. What's vaginal atrophy? atrophy? <gasps> okay, let me tell you about this. <laughs> this actually is exciting you, I can see it on your face. <laughs> this is, because again, this is so little known about. Mm. So remember I said we have a lot of estrogen receptors around mm. our vulva and our vagina. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is, is as we're going through the perimenopausal change, mm -hmm. so that means we are having menopausal symptoms, hot flushes, night sweats, irritability, aches and pains, mm -hmm. our hair might be thinning, palpitations, the brain fog. But also what happens is that we don't get enough estrogen that goes into our vulva and our vagina. And why mm -hmm. is that important? Because it supports the vaginal flora. 
We are born and we will die with lots of bugs. We have mm -hmm. E. coli in our mm -hmm. back passage. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we will get, have it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have proteases, bacterial vaginosis. We have mm -hmm. thrush, mm -hmm. a whole four loads of vulval flora. Mm -hmm. And that our immune system is able to cope with. But what happens is, is that the brain goes, OK, I just need enough estrogen mm -hmm. from the fat cells. And so sends a signal to the fat cells and says, please, can you make some estrogen? Because now she's transitioning. Mm -hmm. And um, and then thinks, right, she doesn't need enough down there. I'm so mm -hmm. oversimplifying. Mm -hmm. But you don't get enough that is sent to the vulva mm -hmm. and the vaginal tissue, which means you get vaginal dryness or an overproduction of vaginal um, secretions. Mm -hmm. You can get irritation, an itch that just doesn't go away and it's not thrush. Having sex is really painful. Having a smear can be really painful as well. And what happens is as you lose the estrogen, the cells shrink. And when you mm. get shrinkage, we say that's atrophy. Right. And you get loss of your clitoral head as well and your clitoral hood and shrinkage as well. But most importantly, you get horrible side effects such as recurrent urinary tract infections. Mm. So you lose that mechanism of protection from the back passage mm. around the perineum. So imagine if you've had a baby and you had an episiotomy. Mm -hmm. or um, you've got um, scar tissue down there, or you've got vulval lichen sclerosis, which in my book I've got a picture of what it looks like on colored, on dark skin or colored mm -hmm. skin. So imagine if you've got that and you're going through this transition mm. and we're denying you vaginal estrogen. Well, that's ludicrous. We need to replace that back. So, so estrogen isn't all, isn't all bad. All bad, exactly, yeah. because topical vaginal estrogen, the structure mm. of it is, is it doesn't go into the bloodstream. Mm. The one that we fear a lot is systemic. So mm. that means the one that's going to go throughout your whole bloodstream. Mm. So yes, for you, Dawn, as mm. you are on tamoxifen, mm. um, you might choose never to go on systemic HRT. And that's mm. absolutely fine to manage your menopausal symptoms. And that can be done in conjunction with a menopause specialist mm. and a oncologist. But a lot of my oncology colleagues now who do breast cancer are really driving the change and saying topical vaginal estrogen is safe for women who have had tamoxifen. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so Great. something that most Great. women don't know about. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I want to just end on, um, tell me, uh, like most recently, uh, something on social media that made you smile or you thought that's a good thing. That's a, that's a good way of getting a message across. So one of the things that I saw recently, which actually blew my mind a lot, was the fact that when it comes to women's health, mm -hmm. um, the technology is still so lacking and so behind. Mm -hmm. So breast cancer screening, we still have a mammogram. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know that it doesn't pick up all breast cancers. Mm -hmm. And if you have denser breasts, it, it, it doesn't always pick it up either. Um, There's a really good uh, video, actually, that I saw someone comparing uh, the fact that the iPhone that we've got mm -hmm. has gone through so many different stages. Every six months we've got an iPhone. But when it comes to our women's health mm. and contraception, we still got microgynon, which is around mm. yeah, for like 50 oh years. Yes. <laughs> microgynon, like, uh, yes. That is still not changed. That is true. And I'm still prescribing microgynon. Oh, no, really? And I, it's they just still like, come in a green packet. Yes, they do. Wow. <laughs> so you know. Yeah, I know. Wow. And I was just thinking, actually, that is so true that when mm. it comes to women, mm. in fact, our, our the the fem the technology has hasn't moved on. The way that we still use like forceps to clutch a baby's head, etc., mm. and you know, for birth. Do you that think that's because changed. it is women? Because I kind of think, if it was men, so if men went through the menopause or had babies. There will be so much investment in, you know, how to make it better and more comfortable. Because women used to like give birth squatting, you know, yeah. but then it was seen to be undignified. Yeah. You know, so lie down on the table and give birth, you know, make it harder. I just think it's crazy. I hate having a conversation, a feministic conversation, because as a mother of three boys, <laughs> I can't I feel like I'm demonizing men when I say that. And I'm looking at my sons going, No babies, you're fine. <laughs> it's not but you. But you will teach them and you will teach them about but I do think that if there were certain things that are happening to men, then definitely. Mm. But let's look at the trajectory of men. They're hunter gatherers. They've always been the ones to go and get mm. the food and come back and then the family would thrive. And actually at all the CEO levels at the top companies throughout the biggest top companies you can think of. They're still men, mm. unfortunately. 
And when men drive a lot of the conversations, mm -hmm. then everything else is secondary because that's not their lived in experience. Mm -hmm. But women who do have that lived in experience and that understanding, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, never make and break that's through right. the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I got really passionate about breast cancer health and menopause care particularly, mm -hmm. because if women, it's estimated that you know a million women will leave the workplace if we're not mm. on top of menopausal yeah. care yeah. and for me i think well we haven't broken through the ceiling because you get to that ceo level and then mm. the brain fog sets in mm -hmm. and you're still then pushed to the back of the line that happens when you are probably the best and overqualified person in the company yeah. and you fall pregnant and you pushed back of the line and the person yeah. who was three years your you know yeah. junior yeah. ends up being promoted yeah i definitely have seen That's that happen to me patriarchy yeah exactly but, uh, <laughs> but also but yeah. also i think this is where we as women also need to be able to understand how much the patriarchy has a hold on us and how much internalized misogyny has a hold mm. on us as well yeah. women saying to women well why are you bothering to make a noise mm. why dawn why are you talking about your breast cancer mm. i had it it wasn't so bad mm. well i got over it mm. shut up now mm. do you know and, and i think mm. it's like that constant feeding of within women to going mm. be quiet be quiet be quiet don't mm. talk don't be loud don't take up mm. space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and we were saying yeah. how important it is to it be is. loud and i think that we also need to get to a point where we are unapologetically who we yeah, are. So be unapologetically black. And it will save be lives. Be unapologetically Asian. It would Asian. literally save lives and get people loving who they are. I mean, that's the important thing, right? Sort of love, Absolutely. love who you are, love your body, um, love you know your journey. And I think with that kind of mentality and that drive and with your book as well which you know has women of color in there which most medical books don't i know i mean we turned to that page both of us didn't yeah. we and i said look what i've got yeah. honestly <laughs> because it's as like being on tv when you see, when you used to see a black person for the first time <laughs> on an advert and then we all got excited and phoned each other and i, I had to like me wearing a hijab and i so i still i still get lovely messages um and there's always going to be some trolling people who are like oh you know what are you a token person or whatever yeah. and i think that we need to sort of strike a balance where there is enough of us putting our head above yes. the parapet, but and enough of us making it, and enough of us just so being unapologetically Absolutely. ourselves, working without, together and building. And it, this is what exactly. I hope, you know, with the podcast, I hope that people will kind of listen, you know, understand, share it, buy your book, buy my book, yeah, purposeful love life. This. Look at this, you know, and then Powerful and then we build. But also, women share. It's safe for society. And I love, that's why I love women's health. And I love, like, my women in my community mm. as well. Because guaranteed, if I say something to them, anything, it could be just, for example, think about the coil as HRT. Mm. That bit of nugget, mm. they'll take back and sprinkle it around to everybody yeah. in their community. Anyone that will listen. You know what Dr. Nagat said? <laughs> yeah. She talked about vaginal dryness. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant oh well thank you so much thank for you. coming on it's been an absolute joy and uh i look forward to coming back on again and doing some tv shows oh with you. absolutely it'll be a joy an absolute <laughs> joy thank you so much for having me oh thank you